This video is long overdue. I apologize if the tension is building, but don't worry. We'll be doing that in a bit. Building, that is. This will be in two parts. The first is selecting the components, and the second will be mashing them all together into a fine thermal paste. Don't actually do that. Sites like PCPartPicker.com are good for helping you find online retailers that sell parts for cheaper. Websites like Newegg have really powerful search engines for finding components you may not be familiar with. And then if you're not afraid of a little sunlight, you'll find that places like Micro Center and even Best Buy are decent locations for picking up hardware if you're not willing to wait or pay for shipping costs. Someone is gonna roast me for saying Best Buy. But they do price match with e-tailers like Amazon, so it's not all that bad. The first place to start is... get an SSD, otherwise called a solid state drive. I won't build a computer without an SSD because they're so much faster than mechanical hard drives. Remember, time is money. SSDs save you time, and therefore money. And then you can use that money to buy more PC stuff. Is that how that works? I suggest at least a 120GB drive for the basics like your operating system and a few core programs, but depending on your usage, the more the better. Now the real first place to start is figure out what you want to do with your soon-to-be-born beast, and then figure out your budget. If it's something as simple as browsing the web, typing up documents, and watching YouTube videos, you don't need to get complicated. On a budget, a low-end Intel Pentium or Celeron processor, or even AMD's fairly aged FX chip lineup will do. Though these will both have their drawbacks. Opting for AMD's FX series will limit your upgrade path to virtually nothing, as it relies on using old DDR3 RAM modules. On the other end, choosing a more recent Pentium or Celeron will be a little more difficult to stick within a certain budget, as DDR4 RAM has quickly become unforgiving to the wallet, and newer components tend to come with the I'm new price tag. All of the processors I mentioned come with stock heatsinks that will handle their respective loads cool as a cucumber. As for your motherboard, you'll want to pick something with the appropriate socket. Skylake and KB Lake chips both fit in the 1151 socket, but some boards that came out with Skylake may need a BIOS update to be KB Lake ready. KB Lake boards should support either out of the box. AMD FX chips snuggle up in the AM3 Plus socket, and Ryzen chips are particular to AM4. Aside from that, you'll just want to make sure it's got all the connections you need, like a particular number of USB ports, SATA ports, Wi-Fi, etc. The FX, Skylake, and KB Lake processors I mentioned have onboard graphics, so for this type of usage, you can skip out on the video card if you want. For RAM, this depends on the processor you choose. Skylake and KB Lake chips will take DDR4 or DDR3L, though I recommend sticking with the former. AMD FX processors take DDR3. For light workload computers, you won't normally use or need more than 8 gigs. As for a power supply, 450 to 500 watts should be more than enough. You don't want to cheap out on this. Don't be shocked when your computer explodes if you do. Generally speaking, if you're not familiar with the big brand power supply companies, you can usually trust the ratings on sites you'll find like Amazon and Newegg, given that the ratings are overall positive and there are enough people rating them. And now about storage. If this is a home theater or media PC, you might benefit from a fairly large hard drive, but I will always recommend a solid state as a boot device. Those speeds are a real turn on. If you're a little more liberal with your legal tender, one of the first things you can do to spice up this build is add a cheap graphics card. This will allow you to use multiple displays or even do some light gaming. And with that in mind, it won't make very much sense to buy a $100 CPU, central processing unit, and a $600 GPU, graphics processing unit. You'll experience something commonly called a bottleneck, where one component is too slow to keep up with the rest. The $600 GPU would be wasted money since the $100 CPU won't be able to provide it information quickly enough for it to spit all those frames to your monitor or TV. A graphics card in the proper weight class for one of these processors would be something in the $100 to $200 US dollar range or less. Another upgrade option would be a heatsink for your processor. While most low-end processors won't need it since the stock heatsink will perform perfectly fine thermally, an aftermarket cooler will usually perform better and can be fine-tuned for quieter operation. And in some situations, you may want to swap out your heatsink if you need something a little more snug for your crevice. Case. For the next step up, we'll talk about gaming PCs. If your only focus is gaming, I would stick with Intel's i5 or i7 Skylake or KB Lake CPUs, KB Lake being newer and slightly faster. If you're on a budget, the i3s or even Pentium chips will do, but I wouldn't expect much more than 1080p gaming with some graphical quality compromises. The best gaming CPU available right now is the i7-7700K, excluding Intel's ridiculous KB Lake X chips. If your focus is gaming and some other things like content creation or streaming, I would go with the Ryzen processor appropriate for your budget. The R7-1700 chip is the sweet spot for performance per dollar, but I'll talk more about that shortly. If you're okay with spending a little more money and you're willing to do a little bit of work for a little more performance, you can look into overclocking. 
Intel's K or X SKU chips, like the i7-7700K or i7-6950X, are unlocked and therefore overclockable. Chips like the i7-7700 and i5-7600 are not. That being said, you'll want an appropriate motherboard. 1151 socket motherboards with a Z, like a Z270 or a Z170 board, will allow for overclocking. The rest do not. AMD chips, on the other hand, are all overclockable. In this case, your only clock block will be your motherboard. A320 and A300 boards do not allow for overclocking, but X370, B350, and X300 boards do. Comparing Intel's best KB Lake chip to AMD's top Ryzen chip, Intel's will push higher FPS, but AMD's is better at multitasking. And from there, choosing your motherboard is pretty much the same process as before. Match the socket and make sure it's got what you want. You may or may not want to check for Crossfire or SLI support, but I don't necessarily recommend those options. Having one stronger card is generally better than having two weaker ones. SLI and Crossfire can sometimes introduce problems depending on whether or not the game you're playing supports it. In rare cases, you'll see perfect scaling in performance, that is, two cards is twice as fast. But most of the time, you'll typically see anywhere between 20 to 80% gains. It can also go the other way around, where games will show little to no improvement or even a decrease in performance. Some games will even refuse to open. In terms of performance per dollar, SLI is generally not the way to go, but selecting a graphics card in general will really depend on what kind of gaming you want to do. Nvidia's GTX 1050 as well as AMD's RX 560 will handle 1080p gaming, given some graphical compromises. A GTX 1060 or RX 580 are good for smooth 1080p gaming with fewer compromises. A GTX 1070 will handle 1080p gaming at up to 144Hz and handle 1440p at 144Hz with some lowered settings. GTX 1080s will run playable 4K at high settings and 1440p at 144Hz the majority of the time. 1080 Ti territory is approaching 4K at 60fps, but all of these estimates are heavily dependent on the game and on their settings, so take that with a grain of salt. Unless you play League, in which case you probably don't need more of that. If you are not in a rush, AMD's Vega card should be released sometime soon, so you might want to keep an eye out for those benchmarks. Some cards will give you various options for VRAM. The more graphical details your game demands, the more VRAM you'll want. For example, something like Dota or League don't require much, but games like GTA 5 and The Witcher 3 will RAM your computer for resources. Speaking of random access memory, instead of the 8 gigs I recommended for the light-use PC earlier, I'd lean more towards 16. While 8 will get you by, 16 is recommended for games that require more juice. RAM speeds didn't matter quite as much earlier, but for gaming, you'll see some benefit from running at least DDR4 at 2400 megahertz. If you've got more to spend, I would aim for at least 3000 or so. Do note that RAM speeds are not guaranteed, as they also rely on your motherboard and your CPU. Don't get RAM that runs faster than what your motherboard says it can support, and even then, you don't want to get too aggressive. Each processor is different, and not all of them can handle fast speeds. Note that the Intel i7-7700K processor is only guaranteed DDR4 speeds up to 2400MHz. Anything above that is considered an overclock and therefore not guaranteed. To give you a point of reference, my 7700K chip cannot handle 3866MHz stable. The most I could push was 3733. As for power supplies, you'll want to pick something that'll keep you in charge. For any single card configuration, 600 watts is more than enough. Most computers will be happy with 500 to 550 watts, but the recommended amount for a 1080 Ti is 600. If you're packing two cars, you'll want at least 850 watts. At this range, efficiency can be somewhat important. The 80 plus badges you see on the power supply boxes that range from white to bronze to silver to gold to platinum to titanium all give you an idea of how efficient a power supply is under certain loads. If you're constantly drawing a lot of power, higher efficiency rating can save you a few dollars on your electricity bill. And lastly, for storage, this is mostly to taste. If you're trying to save money, I still recommend an SSD for your primary boot drive. If you can afford a larger capacity one for games, then those will benefit your load times, but not your FPS. In my testing, one SATA SSD is adequate enough. Using an NVMe drive or rating SSDs usually offers little to no benefit for gaming load times. Though, this will also depend on the game and could vary based on your usage. Next up, we've got the content creators. In any situation, you'll want a pretty strong processor. With Ryzen and all its multitasking glory, it's hard to pick Intel's KB Lake line. But, the Skylake chips that are currently available should offer some good competition if you're willing to run your wallet through a wood chipper. As it stands, I would advise waiting until both Intel's processors and AMD's Threadripper are out and reviewed. Though, in most cases, these high-end desktop chips will be way overkill, even for some of you aggressive creators. And right now, the Ryzen 7 1700 has my recommendation. 
Its performance is very close to the 1700X, and if you overclock it, it can even begin to compete with the 1800X, but for nearly 200 US dollars less. Ryzen 7 chips don't support onboard graphics, so you'll definitely want some form of GPU. If you're primarily into audio engineering or music, you won't need any powerful graphics cards, so something in the $100 to $200 range should be fine. Video editing, photo editing, 3D animation, and things like that will benefit from stronger cards like a 1070 or 1080. A 1080Ti would be a tad overkill, but don't let me stop you if you've got the budget. RAM is more or less dependent on your use case. Audio doesn't need as much, but some applications can use quite a lot. 8 to 16 gigs is my base recommendation for audio and photo editing, but you'll want at least 32 gigs for video stuff, and 64 if you work with some pretty high resolution footage like 4K content. As always, SSD for primary boot drive, but for other storage, that's entirely dependent on what you think you'll need. Fast storage is good for all content, since you'll be reading and writing contently, constantly. A SATA SSD in most cases will be fine, but once you start working with large video files, you'll benefit from a RAID 0 SSD array or super speedy NVMe drives. After that, if you plan on saving your work, you may find that having a larger mechanical drive or even better, 2 in RAID 1, will be good for archiving. Such good memories. Lastly, let's talk about the heavy user. No, not me. The heavy users I'm referring to are the folks that do gaming and or streaming and content creation. In this case, you can almost copy and paste the gaming PC I was talking about earlier, but you might want to swap out your processor. Gaming loads typically benefit from having at least four cores, and after that, faster cores and higher instructions per clock are best. This is why the i7-7700K chip is still best for gaming. However, when you move into the content creation space, many applications gain greater benefit from having more cores. Intel's Broadwell E chips like the 6800K and 6900K are great for things like this. However, they're also fairly expensive. If you look at the Ryzen 1700, 1700X, or 1800X, you'll see that Ryzen wins in some areas, loses in some other areas, but comes in at a fraction of the cost. If you are within a certain budget, Ryzen 7 chips get my recommendation. If you have no budget and you want to go back-click crazy, wait for either Intel Skylake X or AMD's Threadripper processors to come out before the end of this year. Those chips are probably going to be super expensive, but they'll also be super hard... core. Intel's top i9 will have 18 cores and 36 threads, and AMD's top Threadripper will sport 16 cores and 32 threads. And more threads are great for applications that can use them. Now, these are all enthusiast-grade, high-end desktop chips. Most people don't need them and can't fully utilize them anyway. But if you do get one, it'd be pretty ballin'. Just like your wallet. Productive in the streets, Threadripper in the sheets. Because sheets have a high thread count. Yeah. The last things I haven't mentioned are motherboard form factors and cases. Mini ITX motherboards are the smallest standard consumer form factor, and because these are physically smaller, they generally support fewer features, like fewer DIMM slots for your RAM and no SLI or Crossfire support. Micro ATX is next up, being shorter than a typical ATX board, usually only compromising on things like SLI or Crossfire. The standard of standard form factors is ATX, and a little further up is EATX, which generally sports all the bells and whistles. Again, choose the board that supports what you're looking for. The case is somewhat subjective. As long as it holds your components and it doesn't act like a hotbox, the rest of it's based on appearance. If you like how it looks and it holds your EATX motherboard and supports your 360mm radiator and your 350mm GPU and your six hard drives, then it sounds like a match made in Unigen heaven. I apologize if this video dragged on a bit, but I tried to be thorough. I get a lot of people sending me PC part picker links, and I'm hoping this will be enough to help you guys in choosing what's right for you. I'll have a build guide coming up soon-ish, but if you can't wait for that, this cool cat in the card up top from 6ix9ine86gaming Gaming, has a video that will walk you through the process. So if I've missed anything, feel free to leave it in the comment section and bump it with a thumb so other people can see. If you've got any questions, lay them on me. Thanks for watching, my name is Steven, and I am a little dim. Bye bye. I apologize if the atten- if- if the tension, not if the attention. I don't know why I said that. Sites like PCPartPicker.com are good for helping you find online retailer- retailers. You'll find that places like Micro Center and even Best Buy. Oh, that kind of hurt to say, to be honest with you. Ow. Now, the real first place to start is to figure out what you want to do with your soon- soon to be born beast. Yes. Or even AMD's at at a a a fa what? Fairly aged. There we go. Since the one hundred dollar CPU won't be able to provide pro provide it, spit all those frames at your TV or mon mon nah. comparing Intel's best KB Lake chip to AMD's best Ryzen chip at the time of this video's release because my nose is itchy. Having one stronger card is generally better than having two weaker ones. 
Did I hold up one finger or two? I don't remember. In terms of performance, in terms of performance, performance per dollar. In terms of performance, performance per dollar. Water. In terms of performance per dollar, performance per dollar. Then those will benefit your load time. Low di whoa, what the, why? But if you do get one, it'd be pretty, pr pr pretty, damn it. This cool cat in the card up top, D top, that way. I've been doing this for how long? <laughs>